ladies and gentlemen, this is the Outdated Wrestling Hour, presented by Bob Smith, available on all your favorite podcast platforms, Spotify and iTunes among them. Bill Apter is a good friend. Bob invented the PWI 500. He played music with B.B. King. Stanley Weston was his former boss. And the magazines that Bob Smith presided over, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, Inside Wrestling, The Wrestler, Various Quarterlies, and my name is Geomacue. Lisa, I don't have to tell you who I am because he just told you. Joe McHugh told you. Actually, it's not Joe McHugh. It's Anthony Pyrus's incredible version of Joe McHugh. He sent this to me out of the blue. I had to use it on the show. Thank you, Anthony. That was hilarious. Anyway, welcome back to the Outdated Wrestling Hour. You know who I am. And I want you to know who this next guest is. She's been making it around in podcasts, on personal appearances at wrestling conventions and the like. She is an amazing person with an amazing story, an amazing dad. She's the daughter of a famous 1970s and 80s professional wrestling star and a real good one. And this show is very important to me because this is one of the first stars I ever laid my eyes on as a kid. I'm serious. I almost get choked up thinking about it. This is someone I've wanted to talk to for a long time. We finally made our schedules jive and I feel very lucky and blessed to be able to bring you the happiness you're about to hear. Ladies and gentlemen, here's an interview I'm really proud of. This is our 45th or 46th podcast or something like that in the number of podcasts we've done so far. Um, but this one is really special to me I, for a bunch of reasons. The first wrestling show I ever was old enough to understand I was about 12 years old in the Albany, New York area, and it was Pedro Martinez's National Wrestling Federation, which promoted in Cleveland, Buffalo, Utica, and Albany. If they, if they promoted anywhere else, I don't know where. They didn't last long in Albany. I know the promotion went from about 1970 to about 1974. Um, they left that station in Albany in 1972 and it was quickly replaced by the World Wrestling Federation at that point. Now, I don't know if it was one of those deals where, you know, they got a better offer or they just weren't drawing and all, but I don't know what the deal was. But I fell in love with the National Wrestling Federation. Our guest today's father was a major star in the NWF. He was around a long time because he was a tag team champion in 70 or 71 when I first saw him in the NWF with Eric the Red, Kurt Von Hess, the legendary ring villain. Paige, thanks for being here so much. This really means a lot to me because, again, it's the first wrestling I was ever aware of, and this is a real treat for me. It's my absolute pleasure to be your guest. And on top of that, for you to be a fan of my dad is even better. Well, yes, he, he, was, he was a tag team champ. Do you remember that show? Are you old enough to remember the, that particular program? Did you ever see it? Which one was that? The uh, the Pedro Martinez's is uh, NWF when it was in Cleveland. You know what? I used to watch TV, and when I was a young girl, my dad really didn't get us involved much in what he right. was doing. So mm -hmm. when he became Kurt Von Hess, um, he had been re wrestling previously as Big Bill Terry, mm -hmm. and uh, when but so when he was in Buffalo in the Buffalo area for Pedro. Um, he had just became Kurt Von Hess. 
And um, he, boy, what a what a start to a career that went mm-hmm. on for many many years. It, it's he was good, <laughs> and he scared me as a little kid. I was like I said, I was eleven or twelve, and he was tag team champion with an equally ferocious guy named Eric the Red. And one of the sad things about this is, and Ron Martinez before he died did an interview with Slam Wrestling. He was the son of the promoter and also the ring announcer for that I federation. Bet. Yes. Yeah, great guy. And, yeah. And the problem was back in those days in a smaller territory, you used to send the cartridges of tapes to the local affiliates that would show the shows. But then they would send them back and they would tape over them. And Ron told me, Ron did tell me, I read that Ron said, Dad taped over everything. There isn't a single existing show from that league. And what a shame that is. Because it was really good. It was a studio show, a lot of action. It, back then, it was called Championship Wrestling with Johnny Powers was the name of the show. Because I guess jo- Johnny was kind of running part of that for, for Pedro. He was a, yeah, he used to, he was Pedro's right guy. Mm-hmm. It, absolutely. But yeah, I, I never, I, I would see it when I was younger on TV. And I even remember the theme song. I think it was, oh gosh, I can't remember. What Classical it was. Gas. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes. So I remember that and and watching him on TV. And, you know, one day I was watching him on a uh, Saturday morning on TV and Mm -hmm. he walked in the door and I couldn't get that. I couldn't (laughs) understand how he walked in the door and he's on TV. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, Eric and him were very, very close friends. They uh, really worked well together. Um, They worked a lot together. with and against each other through the years, mm-hmm. um, up until Eric's passing. Um, but they just, uh, had this friendship. We used to go through, to their house for dinner, you know, those sort of things. It was a very close relationship back then. And wow. You know what? Those two really wreaked havoc in that territory. <laughs> they love to just scare people. That was one thing my dad loved to do is do, cause that's him. So when he would scare people, and, you know, give the look and, and do the things he used to do. People were petrified. Like, they couldn't believe that somebody would be that savage and that vile, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that's him doing his job. So that, to him, is money. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I don't know who was responsible, but in that federation i call them federations some people call call them organizations but i'm stuck because i was a wwf fan and they use that word but anyway um in that organization whoever whether it was johnny powers's idea or mr martinez's idea the villains were kind of allowed to just go at it you know it was like they they had the scariest villains of any smaller they had abdul the butcher for a while they had your dad they had eric the red they had the love brothers they had um who else really went crazy in that in that federation? Or Ernie Ladd? If Ernie they were he, if they were heels, they were heels. I mean, they were really, really scary and violent, and there was almost like no filter on any. Unlike any show I had seen as a little kid, and like I said, they all scared me yeah. because. And your dad? Let me let me talk about your dad. First of all, he's a youngish looking. He was the youngest looking guy to ever do a German uh, wrestler that I've ever seen. He looked very very young to me at that, at that he point. Was yeah, yeah, and you know he always did look young. He he had a young countenance to him, um, much younger than say a uh, Siegfried Stanky or one any of those other guys. The other guy he was his other, partner, yeah, yes, and and so many of the others. He just seemed to be new to the scene. Was that the case in nineteen seventy and seventy uh, one? Well, like I said, he was Bill Big, Big Bill Terry, right. and uh, from what I've been told, because. I mean, I was so young back then, you know, I relied on my dad's friends uh, who are fortunate enough to still be on this earth, like Bruce Swayze, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some of those guys, even when Reggie Love was alive, I would go and meet him for coffee quite a bit. And he'd tell me a lot about what happened back then. And from what I've heard is Hans Schmidt um, was in the territory and said to my dad, you'd be a great German. And um, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he, uh, I think, had a hand in that is uh, for my dad to take on that gimmick. And because uh, Hans was a little older, 
right. but they were very much the same type of guy, very at home, very family orientated, kind, loving, very opposite of what they were portraying. Well, isn't it funny how most of the heels were like the greatest guys? <laughs> you know? nice guys on yeah. earth. You know, I can't, I can't uh, stress that enough because a lot of people think, well, well, oh, your dad must have been a crazy person at home. Quite the opposite. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He he actually um, would get exhausted from putting on that persona for to for the wrestling. You know, he come home absolutely exhausted from it because that's not him. I look back on it now as him playing a part. At the time, I'm like. We weren't allowed to talk about it at home. He would never let us in on any of the wrestling ins and outs. And we were never smartened up ever. And I think it was for us to try and have the... My dad wanted us to have the the most normal childhood, even though it was absolutely crazy. Right. (laughs) It had to be. Yeah. Uh, You know, we'll get into more about your family life too, but I want to... I don't know if you'll like this, but I remember Jack Reynolds was the host of that show in Buffalo. And he used to describe your dad wonderfully. I always liked Jack. Jack Jack was like uh, a fan with a microphone to me. He was always very effusive, always had a tuxedo on. I don't know why, but he always had it. And he was the only one in the place that would have a tuxedo on. The other announcer didn't, but that's just the way it worked. I love it. I'll tell you what, you know, a great array of stars went through there. Louis Martinez and Tex McKenzie and Donny Powers, of course, and on and on. This went for a small federation. They really had it going on. But I remember your dad describing, or excuse me, Jack Reynolds describing your dad. And it was like, oh, he's he's really working on him with those big German boots. He always liked to put, which makes no sense, of course, but he always referred to your dad as big German boots. And as he was putting the boots to some poor, helpless, younger guy, you know, and he and he was like, but when he came to interview, I remember there was an interview once with Eric the Red and your dad with Jack going, Kurt Von Hess, let me talk to you. You've always been very good with me, he said on the, on the air, meaning as a heel, at least you're verbose and you'll talk and give a good interview. And you know what? Your dad was really good on the stick. He could really talk. He loved doing that. Mm-hmm. It, you know, he when he got on the mic, he had rage in him. He would, put, you know, just put it out there that I'm coming to get you. <laughs> and it's not going to be pretty. But, yeah, he really, he, he first, uh, he was really intense. And, and you're not the first person to tell me that he, they were scared, like, even when he walked by, they, they, people would be have absolute fear in them of, you know, what he was going to do. Mm-hmm. And that's just all illusion. And, and now I look back, you know, because really he, he, he put everything into it. But when he got on that microphone, oh, look out. I can't tell you how much fun I'm having having this conversation because oh, like I, I said, I, I am very romantic about that league, about those wrestlers, about that show. Because yeah. it's the first one I fell in love with. It's absolutely the first one I ever saw. So this to me is like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm talking about stuff. And you're the only person on the planet, basically, that can answer some of these questions. So I'm having a blast. Oh, but, I'm glad. I am but, too. But talking about, about your dad's countenance, um, that was the way they did things in those days. It was yeah. completely goodbye, excuse me, good guy, bad guy, not to be seen together. That was real. Yeah. If, they did, if someone they did. spotted you outside in the real world, you would kind of semi act your character. You know, it was the promoters yeah. were real, real serious about that. And you think that's why your dad was the way he was at home, kind of keep brushing it all under the rug and just allowing you kids to have a normal life without that interfering with it. I totally agree. You know what? He was adamant that he wouldn't let his career get in the way of us uh, growing up. And even though we were on the road for 10 years and moved 17 times. Oh, my gosh. That in itself tells you how chaotic and, and uprooting it could have been, you know, work, uh, him working like that. But uh, he gave us stability at home, spent a lot of time with us when he could. He was away a lot. Um, so... It, it made it quite difficult for my mother, uh, Catherine, my sister, Allison, and myself 
like we had to adjust continuously. And, you know, that, um, that really uh, made him feel uh, guilty later in life. Uh, we, we discussed it when, you know, he's retired and he was home and um, he says, I really shouldn't have done that to you girls. And uh, he regretted that a lot. But I say, dad, you know, you had the best career. Like mm -hmm. he goes, what does it mean to me now? Like, because at the time, you know, he, he missed wrestling so much. Um, at the same time, he knew it was um, a lot to do with, you know, our family dynamics and what happened, you know, and, and the things that we used to go through. Mm -hmm. so but he, however, was it lucrative enough for him to justify the moves? Was he making a good living? Was he being treated well? Was he in, in regular worker terms, was he happy with what he was doing in that regard? He was well, was he well compensated enough? Or was everything cool like that? He was well compensated. You know, um, he used to, um, he was so um, in love with wrestling and anything to do with it. He just, it, it was his life. Um, he made a full career out of it. That was lucrative. He ended up um, from Buffalo and uh, as Kurt Von Hess, his first uh, trip out West and took us with him was uh, for Stu Hart. And within three months of being with Stu Hart in 1971, at the end of 71, he had that championship around his waist. At really? twenty nine years old, nice. That's that's something else. Carry, oh, it was that's something I'm very proud of, because Stu Hart was a uh, uh, he was a tough promoter. He didn't let anybody in. Mm -hmm. Legendarily exactly. tough. That's right. You're like really tough. And when you talk about you know keeping in uh, you know uh, staying away from the baby faces and you know staying you know neutral and trying not to get in trouble, he, oh he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to the point where, you know, we would um, sneak around with, uh, he had a, a, a he had a angle going with John Quinn, who is actually from this area in Hamilton. Mm -hmm. um, and John used to put a balaclava on and, and they'd go out, <laughs> we'd go out tubing and, you know, that sort of thing. And it was very serious. If they got caught together, it's game over. Wow. And it was very mm -hmm. clear with a lot of the promoters, even Pedro, like, you don't ride in the same car. You don't stay in the same hotel. Um, you don't eat in the same restaurants. You don't even look at each other. Mm -hmm. That's and, how it was back then. It's true. And he, and he lived that. Um, I didn't have any baby faces coming to our house. It was all heels. <laughs> so even even how, to that extent, right? Well, I think your I think your dad did what he was supposed to do at all times. Yeah. No messing around because like you Always said, if, if he was making decent money, he didn't want to, he didn't want to blow that. That's for sure. No. And you know, for, in Calgary, that's when he really, you know, NWF is when he really hit it as Kurt Von Hess. And then mm -hmm. it continued on and in, into, into Calgary. And from there he partnered with Carl Von Schatz and went to Montreal. And that's when it really blew up mm -hmm. um, when he had that partner like that. And um, from there, I mean, they won provincial championships there. They were the Rougeos and them were head to head. Rougeos were the promoter. And that was in 72. And then um, later on in 72, the Sheik called for my dad and Fon Schatz to come. And uh, they ended up staying from 72 to 75. Wow. And that's and when that won. territory was red hot, too. It was super hot. They were my dad had to go undercover like when he was out in public it was that bad wow yeah i believe it yeah he'd, he'd put on a straw hat and with a wig that was like <laughs> yeah, there, was, there was a wig part here so and sunglasses and you know but the, the size of him he gave it away i mean he was one of those he was just very unusual looking you didn't see men with bald heads back then they're shaving their heads <laughs> um you didn't see um men with a 56 inch chest you know and and just right. big like that you know yeah. going in a grocery store no no but yeah he really he, he he protected the business he um and you ask any wrestler that's still around today that's from his era 
They, that's the first thing they say. He protected the business. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you, you had to work for the Sheik. If 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 Stu Hart and Mr. Martinez were that strict, I bet that Ed Farhart was that much stricter. Yes, and, and he was. And um, I believe that they did so well, um, and the Sheik loved them very much. Mm-hmm. Um, but they won uh, five tag team titles in that time just two years or two or three years yeah yeah and then my they're the record holder for the nnwa title a uh, tag team titles detroit version mm-hmm. um and then my dad went on to win one more with carl von Bronner, so he's got six wow yeah he had a lot of belts i, I checked it out he he did great let's right. cut to let's yeah. cut to 75 where i was delighted okay yeah Eddie Einhorn came up with an idea to go national with the International Wrestling Association, the IWA. Of course, he hired the right promoter in Pedro Martinez. And not it wasn't too long, and I'm watching the show, and hey, there's Bulldog Brower from the old days. There's Tex McKenzie from the old days. Oh, gosh, Louis Martinez from the old days. Wow. And then one day your dad shows up, managed by Al Costello. I went, everybody's here now. <laughs> do you remember that period at all? Um, I do because um, in 75, we were still living in Windsor. My dad was finishing up with the Detroit um, uh, territory because um, Von Schatz and him had split. Uh, I think John, John Anson, um, he wanted to further on on his own. And, you know, it just, they had been together. So in, in wrestling years, that's a long time to be together with a partner. Um, you know, like four years. And so John wanted to go his own way. And my dad um, got word through Ron, uh, I believe, and Eddie Einhorn was doing this thing and Johnny Powers. Um, so he went down to the Carolinas um, under IWA in 75 with uh carl von Bronner, who is carl von stroheim Mm -hmm. um he ended up uh they ended up uh partnering um we were in my mom and i my sister were still in windsor and then we went to winnipeg and then he was down in north carolina and he used to do that he'd go ahead uh, to a territory and settle for us like get get an apartment or get a room whatever we were going to stay he'd arrange the the living arrangements before we arrived because my mother would insist on that um she hated going blindly into a territory nowhere to live Mm -hmm. uh that which we had done a few times and she didn't like it at all i didn't like it either but you know there's a very uncertainty there when you pull into town and you know you got to stay in a motel for a couple of nights and decide where you're going to stay like that's that's kind of tough. But anyway, he ended up down in uh, High Point and settled there. And um, then I think he went back to um, Montreal. No, he ended up uh, uh, staying down there for a while. And then he was doing some shows uh, for IWA mm-hmm. in New Jersey and New York right. City. Right. And that was in 75. And that was, I think, the summertime. And then he ended up going for a while to another territory but he came back in 76 um and continued on and um those new york shows as a new yorker i can tell you and as a kid at that time or becoming a i just graduated high school in 76 i hate to age myself but there you go (laughs) um (laughs) they were big news for us up here because we had the wwwf and that was it and when the IWF come, came to Roosevelt Stadium and other, I think they performed at the Beacon, Beacon Theater, Theater in New York yeah. City. That's right. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, that was a big deal to wrestling fans. It's a huge deal because you, we finally had an alternative around here. And the, the nice thing about the IWA is it had a, a kind of a mishmash of a flavor, a little bit of NWA, a little bit of WWF, because they imported stars, for the, like Ivan Koloff and Victor Rivera. Sure so, enough, yeah. So the fans knew these people already and they were introduced to other people like Tex McKenzie and your dad. And it was really cool. People were jockeying for position to go to those shows. They really were. I, I, I don't know how cool. I don't know how the attendance was, but the serious fans were nutty for the IWA here in New York. They really were. He loved, you know, that 
my dad's always wanted to get into the New York office, mm-hmm. Dick Man, and you know, through the years he did a few shots here and yes, there. Yes, he did. Do I misremember? So, do I misremember him wrestling Bruno Sammartino on television? One time, yeah. So that is true. I remember. True. Oh, that's great. I, I thought Pittsburgh, maybe, or was it maybe New York? I'm not sure. I thought it was a TV match. To be honest with you. Yeah. There, there was. They would always show a highlight of Bruno. Beeling a German wrestler. Yeah. And to me, it looked That's like him. the dad. So I have a feeling that was him. It was him. Ah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. I have the record. <laughs> I do. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm so fortunate that, you know, in the wrestling community today, I have people who are looking out for me and giving me information. And one of them is Vance Nevada. Mm-hmm. He had given me my dad's match, match list, which I, n- I don't know how he did it. And there's over like 3,000, maybe 4,000 matches on that. And isn't Facebook incredible? Oh, the people I love who it. are historians and the people who are taking time out of their lives for no money at all to yeah. post an ad from 1974 for wrestling wherever it took place. I am in awe of these people. Because and every, all, every all time all. I read one of them, right, it doesn't it jog your memory. Go, oh, I remember that. or remember this period. You know, it brings just the newspaper ads bring back a slew of memories for me. I'm sure it's that way for you, too. It is. You know, when I read these and I'm so appreciative to everyone, mm-hmm. you know, I get tagged in so many. And I oh, it is like opening up Christmas presents for me because I had nothing as of like four years ago, I was just winging it, trying to figure it out myself. Mm-hmm. You know, cause the, my dad was very, you know, I, I would know he's wrestling, but I wouldn't know who he was wrestling or, you know, what the, the details of it or, you know, his angle or anything, nothing was shared in the house whatsoever. It was quiet all the time. Um, so now discovering all this, mm-hmm. it's like a gift because there's a lot I don't know about my dad and I'm finding out. It's all good stuff, oh, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll cut to a, a, f- a family thing here. You speak in nothing but the most glowing terms about your dad. It's wonderful to hear and see. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'm assuming despite being vagabonds and, <laughs> and him being hated everywhere he went, that he was a good pop. Was that true? He was more than a good dad. You know, it, it, it was very hard for him to be away from us. That's why he took us on the road. Um, he tried um, being on the road um, when we were younger, like babies. Like, uh, well, when I was born, he was wrestling. So, mm-hmm. um, so we were like younger, you know, living in Hamilton. Maybe I was four. He, my sister was two. Um, it, his heart would ache being away from us, mm-hmm. and he just hated it. And I think that's why he went to Calgary and just took us all with him. And my mom wasn't handling it too well, you know, the absences of him being gone. So we decided to go. But the hard part is when you get to a territory, he's still gone. You know, we could be settled in Calgary and he's in Medicine Hat that night or somewhere else, you know. And it was really rugged, hard work for him back then. But when he was home... Um, he was this wonderful dad who always, um, was not so much a disciplinary, but, um, he was very strict on how we are educated. Um, certainly very protective over us, um, with the nature of the business he's in. Uh, he, um, always made sure that we were provided for and, um, but our time together was very special. It's like because of the long absences, it made it 10 times better. But I, he really was a gentle, kind, loving father who always made sure his girls were taken care of. It's awesome because, you know, I've heard, I've heard about other wrestling children who were like, I never saw my dad, I never saw my dad, I never saw my dad. Yeah, yeah. It sounded like Kurt went out of his way to make sure – I, I don't want to be corny, but it sounded like it, from the way you talk, he went out of his way to make sure that even though he wasn't there, he was there, you know, and it was, his heart was there at home. I've often said that, you know what, if he wasn't there, he was trying to be there in the sense that he would, I remember he had this gear bag and in the gear bag, he'd have um, a bag, like a drawstring bag 
full of quarters and dimes. <laughs> so he could call us and let us know from the arena mm -hmm. in like Cleveland or wherever he was. He would phone every time he arrived before, and he'd always go early to the arena because he liked to help set up the ring. Really? Yeah. And he liked to set the ring up so he could find out where the soft spot is. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's awesome. I, I, I'm Somebody told me that. Now, you're, you're telling me this, and I'm thinking, first of all, most wrestlers hated setting up the ring, all right? They wanted no part of it. But your dad didn't, and it's not like he wasn't working hard once he got in there. But oh, he yeah. was kind of doing it to make sure he knew where to work. <laughs> that's great. That, you know what? That's the thing. Like he, he, he just he was he was a very smart guy that way, and he loved getting his hands dirty. He wasn't the type of guy that would go in the dressing room and you know, like a couple hours before the matches when there's nobody in the arena and they're setting up. He would often go out there, like I said, and and he'd say, you know, like, oh no, no, like he actually. It's not that he didn't have trust issues. He didn't have trust issues with the guys putting it together. He really wanted to know where that soft spot was. Mm -hmm. Smart guy. But those rings were tough. They were like plyboard with oh, a, yeah. a mat over it. Oh, those mid-Atlantic rings and stuff like that were, with, with those ropes that were like cables? Ugh. I don't know how they bounded off those ropes. I, I know you did work in the mid-Atlantic too, and it's like, oh, gosh, they must have cut into the flesh. Really, seriously. Well, there's a, he used to have major rope burns on his back and, you know, mat burns and, you know, black eyes, all that stuff from, from just, you know, really tough wrestling. Yeah. And his body was sore all the time and, you know, but he was very minimal on his injuries because he was in such good shape. He was and in he, great shape. He always, you know, something, I just saw a match from him from 2008, which is a long time since, you know, the Pedro Martinez days. Looked the same. Looked exactly the same in 2008 as he did in the 70s. That's a long career. It is. He had a long, uh, great career. I mean, there were some down times, of course. But, mm -hmm. you know, in general, he just had a standard when he worked. And it got around to all the other territories. And he was one of those guys. that He'd come in and always put on a good show, no matter what. I don't know my dad ever had a bad match. I'll tell and you what. Did, I, and if he did, it was the other person's fault. You know, I agree with that from from the matches that I re recall. Oh, gosh, here comes Kurt Von Hess and Eric the Redder. Here comes Kurt Von Hess by himself. Uh, Pedro pushed him because he knew what he had. You know, he knew what he so had in Kurt. Yeah, yeah, yes, he did. And he you could tell from the way he was that. tell the way he was used. He was always a focal point on the hour show every Sunday morning. It was on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. I even remember the Sunday time. Sunday mornings, that's right. Yeah, and yeah. I'll tell you what. He... he your dad was a star. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, I agree. He's got the track record, the number of championships. Of course, of course, championships don't. If you really think about wrestling in a in a real life term, it doesn't really mean that much. No. But I know he was respected by the other guys, and here's how I know this: I don't have to even ask anybody to know how respected your dad was. Mid Atlantic television match against Ric Flair. He was holding the belt, Flair, at that point. Yeah. Here's how I know you that Ric Flair respected your dad like crazy. Most times in a television match, no matter if it wasn't a regular in the territory, and I don't know if Kurt was, but this is the main event of the TV show, and your dad was over in the match as much as Ric Flair was. I agree. Knocked him out of the ring, almost knocked him out, scored a couple of near pins. It was <laughs> back and forth. It wasn't the usual television match between Flair and anybody else. I think Flair knew how good your dad was and wanted to go with him. And they went like crazy. Do you remember I that did. match? I do. I've watched it several times and I've analyzed it and looked at it. And I'm like, and you can see that Rick had respect for my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad was his elder there. And, you know, th there's a thing in wrestling where, you know, you respect your elders. You respect those, those old, you know, not, well, they say old school now, but, you know, like my dad used to respect the, the, the older guys. Like they were God to him. You know, like Luke Thez or, um, you know, Bruno even. Mm -hmm. um, my dad had such a level of respect for those guys. And I think that is part of wrestling and um, how they carry on um, the legacies. And, you know, he. so I think Rick was, um, you know, knew my dad was a legend and, and a hard worker and a good worker. And 
you know, he could have, they could have thrown anyone in there and Rick could have just flopped them around like mm-hmm. a rag doll, but not my dad. That's not what that match was at all. Your father no. was up most of the match. In fact, he knocked Flair out of the ring twice. Once when it looked like Flair was about to win, your father came roaring back. And I'm like, Flair knew. Flair absolutely knew who he was in with. And you know what? When they're real professionals, they want to put on a great match every time. And that's, I think, what both your dad and Flair wanted to do in that case. And it, it shows. Agree. It really shows. My dad could go into a high school or, you know, a, a high school show. Or he could be at, a, at the Omni in Atlanta. He would put on the same performance mm-hmm. because he loved wrestling that much, and he respected it that much, and he respected his opponents. And you know, he he just loved wrestling. That that was his gift, mm-hmm. and he shared it with the world. And I love it. I don't want to name any names, but I used to cover the NWA when I was with the magazines. And I mm-hmm. will tell you right now that if there was no TV cameras at, at certain shows, some of the guys did not work nearly as hard as they would have if it mm-hmm. was a pay-per-view or a big mm-hmm. arena event. You know what I'm saying? You can yeah. just tell that they yeah. were going at half speed. But then, you, to- then you have the rare breeds like your dad and Flair who will go at top speed no matter who's watching or how many people showed up. Like I say, it could be 10 people in the audience or 20,000. Mm-hmm. You do the same performance, the same wrestling move, the same uh, intensity. Right. You know, he, he gave it his all. And he he was like a relentless wrestler. He'll go after you until it, like he would constantly on you. Mm-hmm. Like he and, the, you know, a lot of guys have said it was like working with him was like having a night off. Really? So, yeah. Fred Curry said that once. Um, That's high praise from a guy like him, yeah. Oh, Fred Curry? Oh, yeah. My dad and him had a great angle going in Detroit. And uh, he said that's one guy. He says it was like working with a feather. He goes, never hurt. My dad never hurt a wrestler in his life. Never hurt an opponent, ever. But he was hurt by inexperienced wrestlers. Oh, yeah. I I bet even during TV matches, somebody wrote potato. You know, I've heard those stories a million times, you know. Yeah, the potatoing went on after, you know, something else didn't, which got messed up or, you know, like, mm-hmm. yeah, he, he really gave it his all. But yeah, I, did you ever hear of the story about Johnny Powers going after him on TV? Let's hear it. So now that I just remembered it. Um, so I did hear um, somebody, I can't remember who, told me that when my dad premiered as Kurt Von Hess on the NWF on Buffalo TV, um, Johnny Powers came up, came out and said, your, your accent is fake. You're not German. You're big Bill Terry with a shaved head. And he outed him on live TV. He said that? Yeah. And mm-hmm. I don't know what Pedro would have gotten out of that. Mm-hmm. And then that started a, a thing with my dad and Johnny Powers. So I, was, I, I have that question. With, I wonder why he would do that. That's so unlike that time period. Right. Now, they would do it now, but but then, no. 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 You never revealed right. somebody as someone else back then. No, but J- Johnny Powers did. Johnny, yeah. from what I read about Johnny Powers, and I, I admired him as a kid. I thought he was the best wrestler because that's what they said on the show, <laughs> you know, because he was the champion. Or uh, back then, I think it was the North American Championship they called it, the NWF North American Title. I think. I'm hoping I remember that correctly. But he <laughs> okay. was. He was. The, well, the show was named after the guy, so he's obviously in cahoots with the promoter. And now we know that, but back then you didn't. He was like a son to Pedro, if what I understand. Right. So yeah. the thing is, if he came out and said stuff like that, he obviously felt he had a, a long leash and could pr- pretty much get away with anything. I don't know. I don't know why he would do that. that that's that's unheard of to me. Yeah. So what was there any so the heat? Reason why I brought was that there, up. So was there any real heat between the two after that? So after that, my dad was mad. Like, why would you do that? And Johnny and him had a very tumultuous behind the scenes relationship over the years. And, you know, my dad worked in uh, for NWF and then again in IWA. And, you know, Johnny just, I don't know if it was jealousy or um, envy, envying my dad's talent or what, but 
my dad and him didn't gel at all. And my dad loved everybody and got along with everybody. But he was one of those guys that just, I, I think a lot of the other wrestlers would agree. But, you know, here's the, here's the fun thing about that, though. It didn't hold your dad back at all in either place. I oh, mean, no, he, he was he was still pushed as, as a, one of the major stars there. So the opposite well, happened than what you would think. Because usually when you say something like that TV on TV, you're going to expect the guy to get buried. But he didn't get buried. He got bigger. He got bigger. Yeah. And so he partnered with Eric. And from then on, it went out. He was Kurt Von Hess. After the, after the 76, 77 period, what happened throughout the end of his career at this point? So, um, so from 76, um, we were all living in High Point, North Carolina. My dad was working for IWA. Um, I think he was a single at that point. Um, those are the, so. those are the IWA shows that nobody saw because they left syndication. Um, but they're on YouTube. Are they really? Up. Yeah, IWA shows? Oh, yeah, yes. But I'm talking the late ones now that didn't have Jack Reynolds on them. Because oh. I, 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 I know there are some shows that um, when they, they kind of promoted in the Carolinas, like you said, and they weren't going national anymore, they, they perpetuated because they were still drawn pretty well there. Yeah. My, quite, my question is then, well, you tell me, did it hang around a lot longer than most of us think? Because when it went off TV here in New York, we figured... They fizzle, but apparently they were healthy enough to withstand that and it lasted another couple of years. Am I right about that? I think it did last a little bit longer, and I think John, um, Johnny Powers ended up bankrupting it, from what I understand. I, I could be wrong. Um, I think he was had his hands in other businesses, too, and things didn't go so well. Um, I know my dad left before it sunk, um, and that's when we met the Wild Samoans, Afa and Sika. Um, who are still to this day our family, and um, I call off a dad because uh, <laughs> I, yeah, he stepped up when my dad passed away suddenly. Daffa stepped in and said, "Hey, you know what? Your dad was my best friend, and um, you know, you you need anything? I'm your dad now." And he's been like that ever since, and it's it it just is so heartwarming to. But we traveled with them quite a bit. So my point is that when we left, uh, we met them in High Point. I think the ship was sinking at that point um, by the end of that summer. Louis Martinez was in there. Um, Phil Watson, um, uh, Wes Hutchins, one of the Love Brothers, um, Sonny King. uh, Um, Larry Hanimi? Pardon? Larry Hanimi, or was he Lars Anderson at that point? Was he still running that, at that was, point? Yeah, I think he was Larry at that point. Yeah, he kept um, flipping back and forth. That was part of your yeah. stick back then. Yes, yes, Mr. Personality. <laughs> 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 um, and uh, yeah, Sonny King, uh, hippie uh, uh, Mike Boyette. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alpha and Sika. Um, you know, we all stayed in the, and oh, and the Johnson, uh, d- d- um, Oh God, Ron Johnson or uh, Bull Johnson and his. Uh, oh yeah, Big Bull Johnson. That's right. He was also in New York, yeah. And Dan and uh, um, Randy, uh, his sons, who uh, they're all passed away now. God love them. Um, Randy just passed away recently, and um, but yeah, he had a busload of midgets um, that he would bring in uh, <laughs> for the IWA shows, and he packed them all in one hotel room. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, uh, I was standing with my dad one morning and, uh, you know, it was really early in the morning and we were about to, my dad used to take me, you know, to the bank or wherever just to spend time together. And we were about to leave and he see, saw a bull and he goes, Bill goes, Bill was a real comedian. He goes, watch this. And he opens the door and all these, there's like 10 midgets in there. I say midget, I'm sorry, but that's the term we said back then. And I've yes. actually met. Be, Little be, people, and they say, "Please call me midget." I'm like, "Okay." Be, it, be it that this is be it that this is an old time wrestling show, um, the outdated wrestling hour is the name of it. Um, it's okay to use that word here because I think our people know exactly what you they mean understand. when you say midget. They understand yeah. that was the parlance of its era, as was your father's persona. To be honest, oh no, kidding! You know, you you would not do that now. You could no, not get away oh. with it now. No, I know. I know that like the WWE is trying to do a g- little bit of a German thing going on there, but it's nothing to do with how my dad used to do it. No, no, 
Right. Like, and, there but, was a lot of reference to some really dark stuff, and I'm like, well, I don't want to know. Like, no kidding. And I'll I'll tell you something else. The way they depicted the Japanese, it's like the promoters. It was it was it was well the way they did things back then. But if they wanted to heal, they'd be from some other country. Period. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it was it was gold, and it did work. I mean, this, did. look at the, look at the sheik, the the part that he was this mysterious Arabian. Oh yeah, from Sudan or no Syrian? I think S- he was S- Syrian? Syrian, right, right. Yeah, but it, yeah, it's like, but they, that's the way they exploited. You know, that was the exploitive way they promoted wrestling back then. Beat those bad they guys. Ethnicity, actually, yes. um, and then the political climate with the wars. You know. My dad was wrestling in 71 as Kurt Von Haas, and, you know, the war ended, what, in 45? Mm-hmm. Think of all the people that are still around in those years and, you know, really went through hell, and they're watching this guy in the ring doing that. It's yes. like yeah, that, that was towing the line. That was really t- walking a tightrope for you, Dad. It really was. I'm, sure, really he, I'm sure he was acutely aware of that, too. It must have made yeah. things sting for him so hard when he was alone. It takes a his special type to get through that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His conscience would play on him, but, you know, when you're working for a promoter, they expect everything from you. And when he he had to perform like he always performed, and when he, he never went off script, he never, you know, he was very, very, like, into what he was talking about. And he meant it. Right. And... You know, a lot of people, like he'd look at a little kid in the audience and he'd have the, I always remember this, he always have the tag rope in his hand like this and he's waiting, he's watching his partner, like say Von Schatz in the ring. Mm -hmm. And then he'd pick out a little kid in the audience and he'd look at him and just stare him down. And to the point where this kid would bawl his eyes, like cry. And then he'd just giggle. He just thought it was the greatest thing. Like, but those kids that were scared would go and tell their other kids, you should see what this guy did to me the other night. Right. Without touching him, just looking. Yep. It takes yeah. a good heel to do that. Yeah. I, I saw Baron Cicluna almost cause a riot in Albany 1975 just from sneering. Mm-hmm. Sneering. If you, if, you had, if you had that countenance like your dad did, yeah. you can get away yeah. with a lot with just a look. You don't even have to say anything. And you your dad was good at that too. He really was. He had the stare down pat. He did, and and his the look when he was on the aggression. Uh, excuse me, when he was being aggressive in the ring, when mm-hmm. he was on top. Oh gosh, I saw a match with him and Danucci, I believe, and it was like just so intense between the two of them. Because when they both got hot, they really got hot. And yeah. that was a memorable one for me because Danucci was passing through there at that point. Wow, what a match that was. He, um, yeah, and you know what the greatest thing is? You know what these guys when they used to wrestle. It was like a joy to them to find, you know, like they know, say my dad would know Fred Curry or he would know um, Tony Marino or somebody like that Mm -hmm. Um, or the Rougeos. He had such a level of respect for them as opponents that, and they did too, that those matches were absolutely out of this world. Like, and at length. Like they would have lo- like today's matches. What are they? What five minutes, ten minutes on TV? You know, back then you do. I mean, a live match would be, you know, a, let's say a tag team uh, championship match could last an hour, right. forty five minutes. Oh yeah, people forget that. They forget people forget that. that. Yeah, they do. They do because now you have fifty minutes of talking. 10 minutes of walking through the ring and five minutes of actual action. It's, I, it's I, ridiculous. I said that. I said, nowadays it's, you know, pyrotechnics, there's um, lights and, and, you know, flashy, you know, when back then it was just the guys doing their thing. Yep. You just needed one light over the ring and let's go. Yeah, let's go. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And they didn't need ring music. They didn't need florid introductions. They didn't need to say anything. No. You they could didn't. build. A, they were better than at building. I insist they were better at building a story in the ring as opposed to having to build a story before the match. Oh yeah, like my dad was a, a when he was in the ring. I don't know if you if you listen closely to some of the tapes that are on uh, uh, YouTube. He was very vocal when he wrestled. Mm-hmm. Just yelling and a lot of 
that's why he lost his, his voice was so hoarse from doing promos and from this yelling in the ring that he did, mm -hmm. literally. Um, that also intensified what he was doing. You know, especially in Japan, if you listen, watch some of the Jap Japanese um, matches he had, they had microphones over the over the ring, yeah, mm -hmm. to catch the noises, and um, you can hear him hollering and and yeah, like, and that would made you know when I hear that, it it just tells me his passion for it is just like real. Well, like, let me let me ask you about about the Japan trips he made, or if, was there more than one? Yeah, he made six. Okay. Here's the question. From what I can tell, yeah. Throughout my entire wrestling life, from years in the magazine till now, the word Japan makes wrestlers light up. Bing, we're going to Japan. Wow. Was it that way back then? Was it something special? It was absolutely something special. Um, the first time my dad got to go was um, with Von Schatz in 73, I think. Um, and they would go six to eight weeks, sometimes 10 weeks. And very lucrative. Very. Yeah. 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 We signed a contract. It's It was sent to our house. I still have a contract from All Japan from my dad. <laughs> Alibaba, is it, not Alibaba. Uh, Giant Baba signed the bottom. And my dad signed it. Um, when my dad went there, that changed him, his perspective of wrestling a lot. Because um, they that's a different dynamic of wrestling in japan yes, it is. absolutely it's much more disciplined it's much more it can be more vicious it's grueling traveling um you're on the road and you're working every day mm -hmm. like you earn those money that money but he he really found a level of respect for the um culture um for the way they wrestle and the way they treated them japanese promoters treated these guys like kings literally like they would um although there was one time at bond shots told me this one um uh, my dad and him and on that trip in 73 inoki was in the uh right beer rest uh steakhouse and my dad this is uh john anson telling me this he said that my dad and him were starving and because uh, again of baby faces and heels they wanted to go into this Ribera restaurant and Inoki told the owner, lock the door. And they never got to eat. So I heard it firsthand from John. John lives on an island in the Caribbean now and he keeps in touch with me once in a while and we share some stories. And he told me that one. I'm like, wow. He goes, because of who they you know, were um, and the fans were like rabid for them grabbing them and and like john said a few times they had to like like punch back it was so bad that's a no-no you don't do that yeah you're not but, supposed to right no never but if you're in a little trouble sometimes you have to you know you have to kind There's, of break that rule that, a, little, a little bit yeah yeah i think that's what john was getting at that it was really tough um for them to to try and work and and you know they weren't they were really deep in into the characters, like into the um, gimmicks and into the um, the story they're trying to create for that time they're there. You know, that brings me to another question. Your father was with such a realistic portrayal of his character. Were there times even here in the States where he kind of feared for a little danger happening outside the ring? Yes. Um, he's been attacked outside arenas. Um, he's been... Um, attacked in the arena, leaving, of course, she's had things thrown at him. Um, uh, one story I do have that involved my, my sister and I, my mom, um, we weren't allowed to ever go to the matches because it was dangerous. Mm -hmm. We, and if we did, we had to keep quiet and shut our mouths. <laughs> I, if we revealed who we were, my dad said he would like instill it in us. Do not say anything. And my mom would be with us. So she was pretty strict and she'd like zip it, like mm -hmm. just watch. And if I got to, you know, just don't say anything and watch it, 
I would get to come an, another time, but he would pick, you know, very rarely we get to go. So the one night was in Cloverdale, BC. And uh, my dad was wrestling Sika uh, on Hawaii. And I think it got a little real. It got a little violent. Um, the crowd was out of this world like crazy. They were just going crazy over this. And um, we always had somebody um, in the back who would come and tap my mom on the shoulder and say, okay, you can go to the car now. Because a lot of times my dad would finish and run out mm -hmm. and beat the crowd coming out. We would take off, done. Um, but this time we're waiting outside and he's not coming out. And we're like, what the heck's going on? We didn't see what happened with often with Sika and my dad. So he came out and he had his gear still on, sweating like and he always had a towel around his neck and blood pouring down his head. Um and he's he's like running to the car. And I'm seeing, uh, but there's like all these fans around him following him out to the car and um, throwing cups of urine and lit cigarettes and just garbage at him. And he barely got in the car. And don't they surround the car and start shaking the car? There's my mom, myself, my sister, my dad. And I'm looking at my dad there and he's just dripping in stuff. And the car shaking, we're all screaming and just Aww. absolute fear. I, I really thought the car was going to tip over. And um, luckily, some other wrestlers came out and um, security. I don't know if it was security police. I think it was the police because it was a big match that night. And um, they broke it up. No, but good. to see my dad sitting there with that garbage and smell, I could smell the urine off him. Oh, gosh. Um, and we drove off and I, I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I've never been so scared in my life. Sure. And after that, we weren't allowed to go anymore for a long time. Mm, I can yeah. see why. I can see why. Yeah. So the big, my dad was always ensuring our safety. Um, that was his number one thing. Yeah. You know, he was just so afraid that somebody was going to lash because there's a lot of crazy fans. Well, that's why one of the old timers told me. It, when we had to leave the arena, we had to do it like the Beatles. Run, yeah. run, run to run. run to your car. Yeah, run to your car, no matter That's where it was. Deal. They loved the, the they loved the arenas that had indoor car parts. They were the best because they could you could kind of separate yourself from the fans. Not every arena was like that, or a small place. You know, they and would be parked the, right around yeah. the back. Yeah. And back then, they didn't really have that much, you know. And you know, we say the Omni might have or something, but. Um, yeah, these other arenas were just like, yeah, and my dad would know, okay, where do they go? You knew the route we had to go. He'd tell us which way to go. Like he was he methodical about it um, because he loved us so much and just wanted us to be safe. But, and he was really uncomfortable with us coming. Yeah, he I didn't like us coming to the matches. Uh, it made he all the like sense us, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't like us to see that um, because uh, he, had this persona at home, you know, and I would see him on TV, of course, but to see it live, it's a different story. It's like, that's not my dad. Who is that? You know, yes. you, you just, you get lost and I, it, it was very confusing. You know, I thought of you watching a recent WWE match. It was Gunther against yeah. Chad Gable. Yeah. And they had Gable's two daughters at ringside and when he lost the match one of the little girls and this was no no work nothing fake she was yeah. crying crying her eyes out and the wrestling community was upset first of all well don't you smarten them up blah 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 you know you know how they think nowadays but this one little girl was really beside herself sad and i was That's taken great. aback by it too i didn't know how to react to it i well, i, I think yeah. You think of the nature of the show, it's supposed to be entertaining, it's supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to be watching the wrestlers and you see one the little girl crying. That to me just is like not part of that should not be part of it. No, I actually absolutely agree because she might have thought he was hurt. 
you know, physically hurt or my dad, my dad lost and he's, 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 you know, he, she just couldn't take that aspect of it. I, I don't know. She didn't look any older than 10. So I'm thinking, did they exploit this for a cheap, you know, moment on television? I hope not. But Nothing by the same token, I, I think that if your kids are going to react that way, don't bring them. No. And I think that was my dad's philosophy. He didn't like us to see the violence. He didn't like us to see, um, I mean, we didn't know it was fake, really. We didn't, we weren't smartened up, like I said. And the thing is that he would be very, um, you know, at the time he was putting on a performance and we wouldn't, he was so afraid of a misunderstanding that he really was hurt. And we might react. Um, so that's why we didn't get to go. Yeah. Smart. Mostly I just, uh, he was, he was, he, he, he kept us away from the riffraff of the business too, which there's a lot of, um, especially the amount of times we moved. Um, you know, we didn't have many wrestlers come over the house. Um, he had some of his friends come by. Um, Andre the Giant came to our house. and Wow. Windsor. <laughs> Hi. Yes, I, my dad woke my sister and I up and said, we have a special guest. And I went downstairs and looked way up and I'm like, oh my, I was, thought I was dreaming. And this is just before he did the $6 million man as a Bigfoot. Right. And uh, he came in the house and I, I shook my hand. I, my dad always taught us about manners. You look people in the eye, you shake their hand. And I, I did that and I looked way, way up and... My hand disappeared in his <laughs> giant baseball glove size of, size of a hand. And my sister was behind me, absolutely terrified. And uh, my little grandmother, who was Scottish grandmother, four foot 11, all she could say to Andre was, What size are your parents? <laughs> And Andre giggled. He thought it was hilarious. And he looked at her and without a, a beat, he says, my parents were midgets. <laughs> <laughs> so my, yeah, we, and it was so, that was one of the things my dad had a lot of respect for Andre and Andre, you know, my dad was the one that could go in and play Euchre with him or whatever they were playing. Mm -hmm. You know, he was part of that. Uh, a lot of guys weren't. Right. You tell him to get out. You know, but not my dad. My dad was always a, a, a very good, um, anywhere he went, he was accepted and loved and, you know, respected. That's and great. Uh, that makes me, and I and I know that now through all the talks I've had with all these wonderful people. And, yeah. Yeah. Like is yourself. It, and, oh, you isn't, know, it, it, isn't it great the way the last five years or so, there's a bubbling up of, of remembrance for the stars from his era? You know why? I think people are, are, are nostalgic about it and they miss it greatly. They miss the flavor of 70s and 80s wrestling, I think. 60s too. I think th there's a lot of, um, yes, because back then that type of wrestling um, was so re realistic mm -hmm. and so um, people bought it. Like, oh, oh could, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, it it was their entertainment, and I find nowadays it's it's too soft. It's too um, the, the the wrestling moves are not there. The wrestling itself is disappearing, and it's more of a uh, entertainment show to me. And you know the art of it, which my dad I believe is part of the carriers of it. He he carried it forward from his mentors and 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 people he adored. He's carry, he carried that through, and he was so disappointed to see it just get crushed, mm -hmm. especially in the 90s when he was watching it. He loved, uh, he loved watching it to the point where he would critique it all the time. And that's a natural thing for somebody like him to do. Sure. So when, when did he decide to retire, and why did he retire at that point? Was, he, was it getting to him physically? Um, well, he retired um, in... Um, officially in 1989. Okay. And that's when he started to have kidney failure. Oh, gosh. Uh, he ended up, uh, he was in Virginia working, and he um, hadn't been feeling well for a few weeks. He collapsed in the ring, um, his last match. 
and uh, was put on dialysis the next day. He didn't know he was having kidney failure. He thought he had the flu. And um, he ended up uh, coming back to Canada. My parents were separated at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, I have two beautiful sisters in Virginia, Ashley and Callie. Um, my young, I have three sisters. So, um, anyway, they, um, my dad had these two little girls and, um, he ended up coming back to Canada because he didn't have insurance down there and it's very expensive for dialysis. So he came back and went on dialysis for six years Wow! and, uh, had a transplant. And, um, the first, uh, the, I don't know if you remember all the Ilio de Paulo, um, <laughs> events yes um, yes yes so my dad got to go to the first one which was in 96 and he had just had the transplant and he didn't look like Kurt Von Hess at all and, but I tell you he still got in that ring mm -hmm. with Johnny Powers and um Waldo uh Von Eric. Uh, Von Eric you know all those guys his old guys from the from the Buffalo Odd it was the last show of the Buffalo Odd before they shut it down Mm -hmm. And uh, he was honored that night. And when he came out, that crowd went crazy. Because, uh, you know, a few guys came out first. And then when he came out, the crowd, I could just feel the pop of him coming out. And I thought, wow, he really left a wonderful impression here. Mm -hmm. He really did. But sometimes, yeah. He... Sometimes a moment like that, late in in a career. Yeah is what defines it. It's what lets you know how important and how valued his skills were. Yeah. And that means more than money. It is. Uh, there's no price on it. Mm -hmm. He, when he come, when he, I saw him after I said, dad, how did that feel? You know, did, cause he had been so um, depressed and, you know, about being sick and, you know, he had accepted, he can't never wrestle again. Um, but, to go that night and to hear that, he says, I heard it. He goes, I knew. He goes, and I said, did it bring you back? And he goes, just like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he loved it. He loved it. Isn't it amazing how wrestling fans will boo, boo and hiss and scream at the villains, but once they retire, oh, I loved him. <laughs> right? He Isn't would, it a weird psychological thing? It really is. I have had so many guys message me and say the first thing they say was i remember your dad i was so scared of him and actually i hated him mm -hmm. but i love him now yeah 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 yeah. Like only it, only thought, wrestling only wrestling that's the only, only place in the world where, where people feel that way yeah when when i say who my dad is to some people they're like like in the in the wrestling community of course a lot of people do remember him you know in general but um, you know, people who are really, you know, a fan of the the 70s and 80s um, will always say to me, your dad was like, I like I adored, like I love to hate him. That's yeah. that's the expression. They love to hate him. That's right. They did. That's right. Yeah. Oh, what a career. Oh, amazing what, career. what a conversation. I, I, I can't thank you enough for being on this show. It's like my I, pleasure. Well, like I said, this means so much to me because, like I said, your dad and the people at that original show with Jack Reynolds and Louis Martinez and Tex McKenzie and Johnny Powers and the Mongols for a while and just go yeah. on and on down the list. It was my introduction into wrestling fandom for sure, that particular program. And I the first it. and, and the first it. the first villain that ever scared me was Kurt Von Hess. At the time, oh, I don't know if I want to watch this, but only only pro wrestling in that era. You'd go, oh, I don't know if I want to watch this. And then the next Sunday morning, you'd turn the TV on and you, you couldn't wait to see it the second time. Isn't it funny? You'd see something that would disturb you, but then you'd want to see more. The only wrestling could do that. Uh, yeah, it's just a curiosity of it all, I think. you know, mm -hmm. and, and the so I think that people like to be, uh, see something that, Dis disturbs them sometimes you know it, it, it makes you like curious you're like well why is that person like that you know why is he doing that to that guy why is he you know, like i just got an article uh yesterday i think it was my dad taking a popsicle stick 
and um, for Stu Hart's promotion, and he got fined a hundred dollars. But if you read the article, he took a popsicle stick out of his his trunks mm-hmm. and hit the guy, which you don't know if he really did or I probably not. Right. Um, but you never know; he might have because he might have been told to do that. But right. you know. Right. Um, what happened was too, though, in the article, it says the mayor at the time was also the, um, uh, the, um, athletic commissioner and he charged my dad a hundred dollar fine. And that was a lot of money back in 71. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, but it also says in the article, um, the mayor didn't like his actions. The other one was that he broke open the head of his opponent mm-hmm. and licked the blood off him. My dad licked, like licked it, like like Ooh. he was. Like, I'm like, oh wow! And the the com- and this commissioner said he didn't want my dad influencing other pe- other children to do that. Good gravy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I messaged Ro- uh, Ross Hart, mm-hmm. and he messaged me back. I said, Ross, what's going on here? Do you really think that? You know, did your dad or my dad pay that fine? And we can't figure it out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to the bottom of it? No. Yeah. No. And he said that was real. That really did happen. (sighs) Ross confirmed it with me. He says that mayor was overzealous with fines. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. Good gravy. Yeah. But but it's but it's part of the deal here. It's it's wrestling, and some people just don't want to hear that. You know. No. You know what? That's they had the mayor convinced it was real. Isn't that cool? <laughs> right, it is. right, right. But I'm sure. I hope Stu talked them down in the price. I mean, a hundred dollars, or they didn't take it off my dad's pay packet. Like, <laughs> Ooh, good <laughs> gosh, I thought that was hilarious. Yeah. Like, so, wait, how much damage can you do with a popsicle stick? <laughs> like, well, back then, yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah if you broke it you in know, half, maybe. Or, right. Yeah. It could be jagged yeah. on one end. Who knows? So what, what's life like for you now? What What is your life like? I know you're, you're very appreciative of your dad, which is so heartwarming oh. to, to see. But what, what is life like for you at this stage in your life? Is everything going well? Oh. Is it? Um, I know you're making rounds at some conventions and other things. Yeah. Um, it You seem to enjoy it immensely. I do. And it's a, it's a fair, you know, it's a new thing for me over the last five years that I got more involved. Um, I've been to Cauliflower Alley twice. The first year I came, I was welcomed with open arms by everyone, including Brian Blair and all the wonderful ladies that we call the Queens. <laughs> um, they, they, you know, it's, uh, Pamela Morrison, Darla Staggs and, um, uh, Bruiser Brody's wife, um, Barbara Goodish. Mm-hmm. And um, they've become very good friends of mine. And we all have something in common with wrestling. And um, when I go to these conventions, I am in my element now because um, it brings back so many wonderful memories. And I've made such wonderful friends. I'm a lifetime member of Cauliflower Alley now in my dad's honor. And with that, this year I was uh, privileged to speak. Uh, in a seminar uh, with Barbara Goodish and Pamela Morris. And Pamela's the daughter of J.J. Dillon. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so the three of us did a seminar on growing up wrestling. And that was a delight when I'm there. And um, King Haku is in the audience and Brian Blair and um, some really nice. Oh, and uh, JBL and, you know, those type of guys were interested in my and our story. Mm-hmm. Our stories, even and, though they, even though their careers were much later, yeah, it just shows you the influence that that people like respect. your dad had. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, like you know, I, I've known Haku for a very long time, but um, you know, for him to come and sit and to listen, the toughest wrestler in history of the world <laughs> comes and listens to my seminar, right, or right. our seminar, and that just blew my mind. Yeah, like. And, you know, I, I found my voice about it because I didn't know how to, um, I, I really studied it hard because I thought if I, I don't want to say the wrong thing or, you know, and I just be honest, you know, when people ask me questions, you know, I don't try to, you know, make it sound like wonderful, you know, I'll just be honest about it. You know, you know, what was your dad like? He was the best man in the world when he was home. 
you know, <laughs> but, um, uh, meeting these people, you know, and doing this, um, these uh, podcasts that I've been doing, um, sharing my stories, you know, it just, it just is, it gives me fuel, um, to keep his legacy alive. I have to, it's my lifelong duty. Well, I'll tell you what, this is why I started this podcast is because when I talk to people like you and other people from the era that I grew up in, the years melt off me and we're both like 19 years old right now talking about stuff that happened to us when we were teenagers and young adults yeah. and nothing can replace that. It's, it's a feeling that I, I can't, I wish I could bottle it because only through wrestling of all things. Yeah. Uh, you know, does that work for me? And I, I started this in January and I don't regret a second of it. It's, it's hard yeah. work, but I'll tell you what, I have had the time of my life this year and I really needed something like this to kind of perk me up. Work great. Uh, and, part, and part of the reason of that is getting to meet people like you. I, I cannot thank you enough for being here. This has been an honor and a privilege, and I hope that we can uh, cross paths someday. And, and, absolutely. Uh, yes, I'm at Cauliflower Alley every year because this year I was crowned the fourth queen. So, Oh, good for you. Yes, it's quite an honor. And <laughs> you know, I, I dig in and I help out and volunteer. It's a wonderful organization to help these wrestlers who are, you know, some of them are down and out with health or mm -hmm. financial problems and they step in and help them because we have we have no pension. Right. You know, there's nothing for these guys. No, it's true. Even today. Yeah. Which I don't believe. Yeah. Well, of course. They're independent contractors. Yeah, I don't believe in that. And they should at least have health insurance, too, if they don't. I know I some of them, they're exceptionally well compensated, but I think it'd be easier. Not everybody can be on top. No. And no. even in the know, WWE today or AEW and, and careers can be fleeting one injury and you're done. So yeah. I, I would love to see health insurance for the rest. I always have felt that way. And, Oh, uh, help, hopefully you keep spreading the word. Maybe something will change. You know, you can only I, help. I, I would, I would definitely um, try to, you know, speak to somebody about this because yeah, when, when my dad get injured, he had no income home, you mm -hmm. know, which should happen very often, right. but nothing given to him. Nothing. But I will say it was a little easier in the seventies when you, when you had an injury today, that had to end up in an emergency room that could take away half of your salary. Yeah. You know, and that's not fair. No, it's much easier back then. Yeah, it was. And not but that it was even easy then, but it's way harder these days with prices and costs and regulations uh, and whatnot. It, it's, it's, it's a hellish scenario. And I don't want to see anybody go through that. I respect professional wrestlers so much. I still consider them the greatest athletes on, on earth. You have to give I, up everything in your life, as you have explained, to be a top professional wrestler. Yeah. You know, you have yeah. to give up so much to, to do it. And this is why That's I respect them so much. A baseball player still gets to go home at night. Yeah. Wrestlers sometimes don't go home for weeks and months. Weeks. My dad used to, I've, I've often said this, my dad would be on the road seven days a week. And he'd work, you know, Probably five days, twice on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Just traveling. Just to, 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 as soon as they leave the arena, they're on to the next spot, you know, or, or find a cheap motel and just everybody gang in on the one room. Yep. You know. Uh, hey, but, listen. Yeah. I was a musician too. That sounds a lot like what we had to go through on the road. You know, <laughs> everybody oh, in one room. Like a everybody yeah, in one room. Rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, it's the way it works. crowd in and you pull the mattresses apart and somebody, whoever was last in, got the box spring. <laughs> That's right, yeah. But I'll tell you what, I bet nobody regrets it. No, because that was them paying their dues. Right, right. And I think today's wrestlers, you know, great. I, I'm so happy for a lot of them, you know, and they have paid their dues, but not like that. No, not like that. No way. No, no, no. Way. Well, I'm... Like, I am so I am so glad your dad paid his dues, and I'm so glad to meet you. I cannot tell you what a thrill this has been. This is Paige oh, von Hess Sutherland, and I'll never forget this show. This is the one I this type of thing. I can't even put it into words what it means to me. So, thank you for taking the time. Uh, come back again someday, I hope. And uh, my all, all the best to you and your family. And uh, keep spreading the word. You're doing a great job out there. 
Thank you, Bob. And I will continue to do so because I think it's important people know, and I'll always carry my dad's legacy. Excellent. Thanks again. Thank you. I do not even know what to say. This is as happy as I've been recording a show since I started this project. This one meant a whole lot to me. This There's just a, a vibe between Paige and myself that's wonderful because she loves her dad, and I love the first wrestling I ever saw, and it's a synergy, and you could feel it when we were talking. I hope you enjoy that half as much as we enjoyed putting that together. Um, I'm still floored. I'm still stunned. This is as good a time as I've had in wrestling in a long time. I just really admire her and her dad, and you got to love this one. I, I just do. And, you know, everybody loves who brought you to the dance, your first dance, and it was the National Wrestling Federation, Pedro Martinez, and that whole crew. I'll never forget it. Classical gas, y'all. <laughs> I wish you could have seen those shows. They're all gone. And uh, they were an excellent action-packed studio wrestling show. Anyway, we've got a lot more coming up for you in the weeks and months ahead. We are not stopping. We're going to keep doing it until we get it right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, join the uh, Outdated Wrestling Hour on outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com where you can hear every show that we put out. We are also now on YouTube and YouTube Music. Yes. You get to see our placard just on top of the hour and a half show. If you could stand looking at my my face that long, you must win some kind of an award or something. But we're just not doing any artwork. It's it's simply the podcast placed on YouTube, as well as YouTube Music, which is the music outlet by YouTube, Google, and all those folks. So if you if you choose to listen to the show there, feel free. Same price. It's free for everybody. But what isn't free is the outdated Wrestling Hour Fan Club. Yes, for a nominal fee, you can help perpetuate the success of this show. You can take part in the Zoom meetings and all kinds of other fall de all. Learn all about it at outdatedwrestlinghour.buzzsprout.com. Write to us at outdatedwrestling at gmail.com. Find me on Facebook. I'm Bob Smith, the guy singing with B.B. King on the lead page. Our theme song is Hold On A Second. Actually, Hold On A Sec, S-E-C. As performed and written by Brian Teo, guitarist extraordinaire. Incidental music that pops up from time to time is performed by Kevin McLeod. This is the Outdated Wrestling Hour. Um, this was a very special show for me. I hope you enjoy it. We've got a lot more guests and fun coming up in the weeks ahead. Just trying to keep that old school flavor alive, man. I, I can't drop it. I won't drop it. Needed it in my life, and I'm having more fun rediscovering it the more people I meet. I hate that corny expression, on my journey, but, you know, it really has been. It's been a great year for this. I don't regret doing one second of this podcast. It has been a lift in my shoe. Speaking of shoes, I have a foot problem right now, and I'm in a walking boot. I don't know what else to say other than, oh, geez. <laughs> but anyway, I want you to come back next week for more. We're here every Friday on the Outdated Wrestling Hour. You tune in wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube or any place you hear noise like this. Peace and love, as Ringo Starr would say, to all of you. <laughs> <laughs>